Hey everybody, this is Rustin Rose with Metalholic Magazine and Access Entertainment. With us today, the amazing Mary Zimmer of White Empress. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Congrats on the album, Rise of the Empress, an impressive debut that's been getting great response so far. Thank you so much. Yes, people seem to be enjoying it. (laughs) And you guys have had a chance to get out and do a few shows now. How are people responding to it in a live atmosphere? Oh, they're responding to it better than we ever could have imagined. I mean, our shows were completely full, and everybody got really, really into it. And we also filmed a live video, and um, that's been going over really, really well. A lot of people were really happy about that. They got an opportunity to kind of see, be part of the action, even if they didn't live uh, around where we played. Are are we just talking about, like, one song for a video, or did you shoot, like, an entire show? We actually, this band we toured with, they're called From Light Rose the Angels. They had a couple guys in the band who are film uh work in the film industry mm-hmm. and they actually just set up cameras and filmed us uh but the same song like each night and then they cut that footage together into a video for us oh, after the wow. tour it was pretty amazing <laughs> nice which track was it for it was for the song the ecstatic and the sorrow got lots to talk about so let's jump right on it tell us about cl- connecting with paul and what what it was that intrigued you to sign on with this project Well, it's interesting. I met Paul because he was looking for somebody to do the keyboards and the vocals on the Cradle of Filth tour uh, last or maybe like two years ago, and I actually um, wasn't able to do it due to things going on um, for me. So I told him, you know, hey, but you know, he he was really cool to talk to and like very nice and everything. And I said, well, if you ever have anything else, you know, you want to work on, you know, let me let me know. And he was like, well, actually, would you want to check out these tracks for this other band that I'm starting to write, you know, this music I'm starting to write? I'm like, sure. You know, and I was just like, I, I was, it was a couple years post Luna Mortis. I wasn't really sure about what I wanted to do, so I was really open to whatever. And mm-hmm. I was like, all right, why not? I'll check it out. So I checked it out, and I was like completely blown away <laughs> by the music. I was like, what is this? I mean, it, it was amazing, and um, I asked him, I was like, what do you want me to do for vocals? Like, what style? You know, most people are like, it's an opera metal, or we want, like, screaming, or whatever it may be, you know, and he was like, I you don't, I don't want to pick a style, just, just do whatever you do. So I just, like, whipped out, like, everything I could do, <laughs> and just did it, and him and Will, the keyboard player, they really, really liked it, so we decided one day, we were like, that we were a band. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, you are really like a Swiss army knife of vocalists. You can do the growls and screaming, sing beautiful cleans, thrash it up, or even get operatic. You're classically trained, but how did you develop so many voices within your own, so to speak? Well, I mean, it's just from practice and, and from like, you know, you can do so many things with your voice, so you don't want to ever limit the human voice uh, to like, I think when people actually, if my, if my classical training um set the stage for all of it, you know, uh, to be able to have the basis of good technique, to be able to understand the mechanics of the voice, and like what you're doing and how to do it, you know, so you can get more sound out of it, because it's such a versatile instrument, but oftentimes you see, especially in the classical world, where they're very stringent on like, this is the only style you will sing, and you only sing it this way, I mean, they're very adamant about not doing other styles, but... I just knew there was a way to do the screaming, you know, very early on that wasn't going to ruin the voice. And I even um, brought my opera teacher, my 72-year-old opera coach, Wages of Sin, (laughs) when it came out, the Arch Enemy record. I was like, how is she making these vocals? And this woman was like, what on earth is this? You know, she was like, I don't even understand what's happening. You know, and at that time, Melissa Cross was very new. So, you know, I just kind of had to uh, figure it out. And then one day I read an article about Melissa Cross, and I ran into the studio where I was doing Luna Mortis Ottoman Empire recordings. And I was like, you guys, this woman is saying what I've been saying this whole time. <laughs> and, and, and they were like, they didn't care, you know. <laughs> they like, yeah, whatever, you know. But, but, you know, I just kind of had to figure it out. But I knew there was a way, you know, and I just applied my classical 
technique. And then eventually I did study with Melissa Cross, and she actually helped me expand the things I could do with my voice a lot further. My screaming was actually fine. She actually worked with me a lot on the rock singing and belting. So right. taking a lot of lessons, doing a lot of practice, you know, diversifying, trying to do styles that are outside of your comfort zone will help you learn to do different things with your voice. Now, of course, White Empress has such an amazing lineup. Fans may already know some of the members, obviously, Paul from Cradle of Filth, and, of course, you were in Luna Mortis, Chella Ray Harper from Cold Chamber. Introduce, yep, us to the yep. White, introduce us to the White Empress lineup through your eyes. Well, I mean, everyone is amazing. You know, I, I've never, I've really, I'm really just, blown away by the musicianship of everybody in the band, first of all. Everyone is extremely on top of their game musically. I mean, very professional. Everybody comes from, like, these really experienced backgrounds, you know, where um, it's just like everyone's at the top of their game in the band. I just feel like there's no weak links at all. Like, everyone is such a master at what they do. And we've got um, Chella, who we have on bass, and actually she and I met back in the MySpace days before she was ever in Cold Chamber, which I actually hadn't even remembered, really. Right. Um, and for some reason, we had stayed Facebook friends, and she came up in my news feed when Paul and I... Originally, it started, it was Paul and Will, the keyboard player, Will Graney from the UK. He is a phenomenal composer and arranger. He does all the strings and the choirs and all the industrial sounds on the record. That's all Will. Oh, wow. So we really have to hand it to him. He's a brilliant composer and arranger, and I was just blown away by his writing, his work. And um, he, uh, he plays guitar in a band called Damnation Angels over there, which is like a power metal band, kind of. Right. And he, um, he's, he and Paul and I were like the core of the band, and originally Martin from Cradle, he was he was writing the drums for us at the very first, at the beginning. He was doing the drums, but he didn't want to join the band. He was just writing with us. Right. And right. Um, we knew we needed a bass player, a second guitar player, another drummer, you know, and I started looking for people. And right when we were looking for bass players, we kept trying people out. And, like, nobody was really fitting what we wanted. We wanted a bass player, not a guitar player who could play bass with a bass player. So we, right when that happened, Chella kept coming up my news feed about her leaving Cold Chamber. And I was like, well, she's free now. I want to see what she's like. So I started checking out her interviews and her live performances on YouTube. And I thought, thought well, it's really, woman is really professional. She talks really well about her instrument. She knows what's going on. And I sent her Paul some of the stuff, and he was like, contact her right away. Hey, this is awesome. So we got a hold of her, and she, she loved the music and was, like, ready to start something uh, that she's more a part of, you know. Um, in Cold Chamber, you know, she was hired on later in their career, and she wanted to do something where she had more of the writing and all that. Right. So she um, she really liked the idea of joining White Empress, so she got on board really enthusiastically after we contacted her. And then um, Zach, the drummer, he came from a, a connection of mine, a friend, Bill Hudson, uh, this guitar player friend of mine, put right. in out in L.A. He, he put me in touch with Zach and um, recommended him. Uh, and Zach has toured with a lot of professional bands like Ugly Kid Joe, and um, he was in Silent Civilian. And he's got a strong history there as well. And, of course, you know, Paul needs no introduction. Right. <laughs> and, oh, yes, and Jeremy. Jeremy is the other key element. So after we have all this settled, finally we got Jeremy on board. And Jeremy is a musician from Madison. And when I was first learning how to record and stuff, he I would record his bands and <laughs> things. So we go back a long time, and he's toured with... Um, some really uh, more of the goth theme type of bands and he he's in this uh, South African gothic rock band called The Awakening totally random Chella and I were exchanging texts the other night while I was at the Guar show and she told me that uh, Kim Dyla aka Volvatron did the White Empress outfits yes she did um, our first run of outfits and um, I actually destroyed mine already. So for these shows, I had a slightly different outfit on because um, from our video shoots and photo shoots, I've already I actually ripped through it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that, that was me being like too crazy while I was wearing it. But she made amazing costumes for us. And in some of the earliest photos, you can see my costume, and it's just 
brilliant. I mean, she, Kim is just a fantastic costume designer and uh, tremendously talented. And the guy's stage clothes she did as well, like Paul's whole stage outfit, which is this amazing, like, jacket and pants and, and you know, it just looks amazing. So she she just, she's a really great designer. And her, her design for the costume actually sparked the image for, like, a graphic novel comic character that this one artist, he used her, basically her costume design for that image. So it's it's really cool how all of the arts and artists and designs and there'll be many more to come are like kind of tying in together and they're all sort of uh, playing off each other, which is neat. Paul has always been the dominant songwriter in his projects. How much were you able to contribute to the creative process for, for this record? Well, it's interesting. I, I got to write all my own vocals, all of them. And it was fantastic because um, a lot of people don't realize this, but in the Ottoman Empire slash Luna Mortis, um, for all of those records, um, I did a lot of the recording, the mixing, the mastering, all of that. But I didn't write a single thing, uh, period. I only wrote two songs of vocals for the entire time uh, I was in that band because Brian was a composer and he would write all the parts for everything. Right. And basically, you know, he, he and I came from a classical world where... I, I thought that was fine because in the classical world you don't write your own music you know you sing other people's com- compositions so I never even thought that that was weird or anything I was always fine with that but then when I got to do White Empress and I actually had the freedom to write all of my own vocals it was like an experience I never had before you know I was like wow you know so I really got to tailor everything to the absolute cost- it was like having a custom instrument or something you know so it was you just got to kind of tailor the nuances and, and I still love to Singing all of Brian's compositions since Luna Mortis. Don't get me wrong; it was just a this is just a new experience, you know. And Paul was very hands off with it, and he was the de facto producer and arranger for this record. Really, you know, uh, we all recorded the parts in our own countries and homes and things. So I would send him what I was writing for vocals, and he'd maybe rearrange a couple parts, you know. And then also sometimes he'd rearrange the guitar or, or the other instruments to match what he wanted to go with the vocals. Or if he liked what I did better with the vocals, he might rearrange the rest of the instruments to go with that. So it wasn't necessarily him arranging things in favor of his own ideas either. You know, he just would take whatever the best musical idea was, no matter who it came from, whether it was him or Will or me, and he would cater to that. And he's a very brilliant producer, arranger. And that's what I love about Paul. He's a, he's a terrific arranger. Uh, he just he just knows what part should go where, and so we got this crazy mixed music, but it somehow all flows together, and that's that's him, that's his arranging. And then the album itself is not a concept, but the band and album imagery, as well as the lyrical content, seem somewhat thematic. Yeah, there's always going to be the overarching theme of the White Empress, you know, but we just didn't want to write concept albums. There are a few, a couple songs that get into this. You know, it's a sort of a dual a dichotomy. You know, you've got the band and we, we kind of carry the look over into real life, but at the same time, we still want to be kind of raw and, you know, metal and thrashy and we don't want it to be cheesy so people because they know they know who we are you know it's 2014 right. they can look at our instagram they can they know who we are like it's period so what we've done is you know can we so kill okay, there's that aspect that there's this concept of the the art the fictional light effort you know and there's been you know our bio written by vk lynn a lot of paintings and artwork by different artists about her and by doing that we've allowed the whole audience to kind of like make this character their own without it like per se being me you know what I mean Uh, and they have this wonderful fantasy like concept character that they can there's various images of they can kind of create their own image of and it's fantastic everyone loves it and I think it's actually, um, but we didn't want to write like lyrically like concept records because that like you know I feel like you get a you get albums that are sacrificing the quality for the sake of the concept sometimes right. just to fit the concept. So I wrote a couple of songs where I was genuinely inspired to write about the concept of White Empress, but I wanted to keep it genuine and make it go with the music. You know, if it's not actually genuine, I didn't want to force it. And also, I wanted to keep a lot of my lyrics rooted in reality and about real topics because that's what people relate to. I mean, some of the albums I relate to, you know, from back in the day are ones that are about real things happening to people, you know, so. At the end, everything that you do has to serve the song. Yeah. So let's talk about the music then. Tell us about Rise of the Empress from your perspective. 
I, it's really weird. Like, I can't describe it because, like, um, one thing I did notice is that even with all these keyboards and everything, that once we started playing the songs live and we started rehearsing them, mm-hmm. and we actually did some studio sessions, and, you know, one of the guys, we, we'll, we, we'll be releasing some video from, like, a studio session we did while we were also playing these shows. And the guy, the producer there, Shane, he was like, you know, he's like, this music is so much thrashier you know, than I, re- than I ever realized. Right. And I was like, yeah, you know, like I didn't realize that, but I think Paul and I, we both kind of have pulled a lot of, a lot back to our roots, a lot of the, you know, crossover thrash and the hardcore and stuff. But then at the same time, we've got like, you know, all these crazy synths and things and industrial elements, but somehow we make it all together. And I think the reason why it works because it works. Like, when I finally listen to the whole record all together, it works, you know, it all flows. And, um, it's like, how do we get all this to flow together? And I think, again, it was a lot of the arranging and working on the arrangements and then also just not being afraid to mix elements, you know? And I think when you're not afraid to go... Metalheads love to, like, stick to their own subgenre, but it's like, that's pretty stale now, you know? That's pretty stale. It's been done in every subgenre. It's been done to death, and people are ready for, for something new. And it, if you're not afraid to just kind of be like, okay, well, maybe these thrashy beasts can go with these crazy synths and stuff and you just take it in for a minute and you go yeah okay it fits but you have to open your mind up enough and allow yourself to try it and to sit with it for a little bit you know Paul would we'd often listen to things for a long time and then continuously make changes you know even after listening to it for like a month and be like you know that's not quite the way it should be you know make a different arrangement or a slightly different vocal part all the way right up until the end we were doing that so we were always trying to listen to the music and be conscious of the arrangements as well and make sure that the listener would perceive it cohesively and that it wouldn't be too too chaotic even even though we have all this stuff going on you know well, that's the thing that I really appreciated when I listened to the album. It's like there are all these nuances and elements of what we would call all these different subgenres, and they do blend together so well and create something new and unique. And, and you guys pull it off. There's some great continuity to it, and uh, and I think you're you, you're on the right track with what you're doing because it's a fantastic album. And I wanted to ask because I know there all the songs in the album are like your children; they're brand new. You guys put so much time and effort into them. But every person in the band is going to have one or two tracks that speak to them perhaps more than the others. Is there one or two songs on the album that st- sort of stand out for you in that way? Yeah, I definitely like um, Ecstatic and the Sorrow, the one we just put the video out for right. with the live footage. It just has these parts that kick in. I think the arrangement of that song is just super easy to get going, you know. And um, A Prisoner Unleashed is really awesome uh, live. Like, now that I've played these songs live, you know, I have a different perspective on which ones I, I I like them all quite frankly but some of them live were just like so they you know what I mean when it really hits the audience right they're really getting into it and then that's when you really go oh my gosh well this one might be my favorite one I don't know <laughs> so uh, but I'm I'm on this ecstatic and the sorrow kick because the, the video just is so cool <laughs> so cool but the, also the arrangement it just was a really terrific I don't know it just kicks in at all the right places I guess is the best way for me to put it all right, a couple quick things before we get out of here. Whatever became of your tracking the trade project with VK Lynn, who you mentioned a little bit ago? Oh, my goodness. Well, VK and I are still the best of friends, as I said, um, from White Rose, the Angels came and toured with us. And they, the thing about it is, is we both had crazy, crazy chaotic years. A lot of things went with her and Stork. A lot of things went with me and White Empress and now her new band. And we both just didn't have time for it anymore. And I don't know if we ever will, but it was an awesome project to get started. And we had so much fun doing it. And we love spending time together and making things happen. And um, I have no doubt that we'll continue to do things together. I just, we're both like just crazy busy. Like we we both kind of just mutually kind of set it aside (laughs) because we just couldn't keep up with the demands and everything. Nice. So last question, just to help us get a better picture of you, because most people don't know who you are yet. Give us three albums that changed your life or informed your musical path. Oh, totally. I got this. (laughs) Definitely. A Life of Agony, uh, River Runs Red, without a doubt. Absolutely. That record still motivates me to this day. You know, Iowa, Slipknot totally, totally influenced me majorly, majorly because of the fact that 
you know, here are these Midwestern kids driving to the same crappy venues we were driving, you know, to, and all this other stuff in the snow. And they were angry about it, and they were from the Midwest and the cornfields, and they got it. You know, I just, I don't know, I related to that record a lot, really, really a lot. And then um, Wages of Sin, Arch Enemy. I mean, honestly, I cannot deny that that's the record that, that uh, seeing Angela on that first tour with them, at, I got to see there at Milwaukee Metal Fest. <laughs> and I was just like, I have to do that. I, ha- I have to do that, period. Like, <laughs> so that's pretty much what sold me yeah. forever. Awesome. Mary Zimmer, White Empress, the debut album, Rise of the Empress. Fantastic album. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. We talked with Paul a little bit back, but it's always nice to get the perspective from the other side and to introduce the the newer faces that people don't know quite as well. So, Thank you so much for having me, Rustin.